Hello, beautiful people. Welcome back or welcome to, if this is your first time, Life Chats with Friends, your sanctuary for nurturing love and wellness as we all navigate life's challenges together, supporting you on your journey to self-discovery and growth. I'm your host, Antonio Stevens, and today we are diving into some weighty yet profoundly relevant and important topics that are privilege, identity, and mental wellness with a specific emphasis on their intersection with religion and or spirituality. These topics are really key and pivotal in really shaping our understanding of ourselves, our place in the world, and how we all relate to one another. This will be a two-part discussion, so we'll dive into all the topics that I just mentioned today, and then the second part will be a deeper exploration of the current state of mental health and well-being, specifically in the Black community. And who better to navigate these intricate concepts with us than the one and only Dr. Andrea Holman. Dr. Holman is a former psychology professor at Houston Tillotson University. She now serves as a diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging program manager for Lyra Health, which is the leading provider of workforce mental health benefits available to more than 15 million people globally focusing on workforce mental health and well being. She creates and delivers educational content on how societal identities affect mental health in the workplace. Previously, Dr. Holman co-chaired the health and wellness group for Austin's task force on institutional racism and systemic inequality and equities. Her research dives into African-American psychology, racial identity complexities, and racial advocacy, featured in publications like The Counseling Psychologist and Harvard Business Review. Beyond academia, Dr. Holman is deeply involved in community work, serving on the board of directors for Humanities Texas and offering workshops on identity, racism, and privilege. She consults on diversity, equity, and inclusion practices for organizations and is a licensed foster parent with her husband, Tapera Holman. They have two sons, age 10 and 6, and enjoy family time, dining out, and American college football. Once again, welcome to the show, Dr. Hallman. And one thing that I love to do with all guests just to ground us in our conversation is by asking you and exploring a bit around what your story is. So what are the lived experiences that have shaped your worldviews and have gotten you to where you are today with this focus, this interest in giving back to society? Sure. It's a great loaded question. I'll say. <laughs> uh, you know, and in thinking about some of the topics that we're going to explore today, I think I'll start with some of the primary identities that I bring into a room, you know, identify as a cisgender, a black or a black American woman. I identify as a woman of faith, as kind of a caregiver, I would say, more broadly. I do have biological children that I made from scratch, but I also have, <laughs> as you mentioned, that we've got some foster care in there as well. And then just kind of caring deeply for children in, in general is, is how I tend to show up as someone who is neurotypical, someone who's a daughter of uh, an Air Force Corner, you know, so a military mm -hmm. brat, someone who's a creature of habit. <laughs> uh, those type of things as a, as a professor and intellectual, you know, and so when I think about this broad idea of my story, you know, I've very much been influenced, especially since childhood, from people who represented those similar identities. So other Black women who were intellectuals, academics, introspective, caring folks, um, your Toni Morrison's, your Barbara Jordan, your Maya Angelou, those type of things. And, and helped me fall in love with the written word, you know? And so I think that writing and care and healing and nurturing is all part of what psychologists do, you know? So I don't think it's an accident that I was drawn to that field and, and never looked back. Once I started college, I said, no, nope, this is it. I'm good. And so, yeah, did that very, as I mentioned, very much creature of habit. And so went to college with the intention of practicing full time. I want to be a licensed clinician. I don't want anything to do with academia or uh, the 
corporate life, you know. Uh, <laughs> funny how life twists and turns will make you eat your words, you know, right? Uh, and, and so, yeah, so former tenure professor, but then turned corporate overlord, as it will. And so, yeah, I, I'm thankful to be aware of my why for working. I'll say it mm-hmm. that. Because mm-hmm. as the different iterations of my career have taken, that why has remained consistent. Mm-hmm. And I still get to do uh, the thing that I love to do, which is kind of be an agent of change and really give attention and validation to uh, minoritized, minoritized communities in this country. Um, so, yeah, I'm thankful to do that. Beautiful. And thank you so much for the work that you do, the work that you're leading, and just recognizing how important it is again at a time like this in the evolution of our existence as human beings and how we relate to each other how we connect with each other and how we support each other as one unit with that i would love to dive right on in we got a lot to cover so my first question for you is if you would be able to provide for us or really lay the foundation for us with more of an overview of privilege itself and then its intersection with various aspects of our identity. So that could be race, gender, sexual orientation, et cetera. Yes. And so I I will say this first of all, before I give that definition, I appreciate that you use the language you used around lay a foundation, because I think where we are in history, when it comes to our access to information, our consumption level of information, misinformation, mm-hmm. um, things get very overwhelming and confusing when and they can be, you know, when we start talking about things that have a lot of um, differing opinions and reactions, you know, around the country mm-hmm. and around the world. And I, a lot of times, and I used to say this in my class and, and also say that Lyra, when you get to that point, when you things start getting murky and unclear and you don't know what you're talking about anymore, you have to go back to basics. You have to go back to the foundation of what you know to be true and build from there. So I I think for folks listening, who was like, I know what privilege is. I I get to whatever, whatever. Hold on. Okay. You know, because there might be a fresh level of reminding that could be helpful in different areas of your life, you know? So, so the definition that I've used, the working definition, when people ask me, what is privilege? It's simply unearned advantage or entitlement. Mm. It's a perk. It's a it's a thing you get that you didn't ask to have. Okay, mm. and there are different ways that that shows up in life depending on what you're talking about. Okay, if you want to give a, a very basic example that most people could agree with before we get to the controversial stuff, right? Let's go with <laughs> people call me doctor. I have a PhD in psychology. That means that people take my word for stuff that they don't need to take my word for, okay? (laughs) I have a small amount of knowledge on one particular field. That's what that means. But people will ask me things and inquire, oh, well, you're a doctor. And I'm like, you really shouldn't. This is just my (laughs) right? Uh, But part of my advantage is that I get taken as with a level of competency, right? And people assume certain things about me and put me at a level where I can have certain access to resources, you know, Mm -hmm. potential jobs or salaries. There's a lot of ripple effects that come with that. Now that one's a little tricky because I did work for them three little letters, you know? So so I earned it in that sense that I earned the degree, but some of that stuff I did not earn. It's just simply Mm -hmm. how people respond to me immediately based on a little bitty thing that they know. Mm -hmm. So if you put that back into the controversial, quote unquote, pieces that we have, like race, like sexual orientation, like gender, Mm -hmm. there are ways in which people can show up into a space and have automatic advantages, perceptions, right, conclusions drawn about them that other people simply don't have. Mm -hmm. So that's where I'd say is my basic definition is a little bit of an advantage or a lot of it, depending on what you're talking about in a space. I think when you're mentioning privilege, and, and if you if this is your first time kind of really exploring this idea of advantage, Peggy McIntosh has a wonderful short article around the backpack, the invisible knapsack of, of, of privilege when it comes to race. Okay. Mm-hmm. So that's one of the when you so we got this building block, right, of unearned advantage or entitlement relating to different identities. The next piece of that, I think, in laying that foundation is to understand that. In societies where you have these social identities and whatnot, that we all have and lack privilege Privilege, in some way, 
Okay. Because I think that's where people can start losing the plot a little bit. Mm. Right. And so, mm. because what's happened is there's definitions of privilege that aren't like the one I just mentioned, mm -hmm. they imply that there is some sort of superiority or that you, all of your life has yeah. been completely easy and there's no struggle. I've heard folks say this, okay, I'm white, but I wasn't raised wealthy. So I don't have privilege, you know, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. We all have and lack privilege. You got to look at lots of different social identities. And so that's where the intersection becomes truly fascinating to really look at what level of privilege you have and come with. And to your point, what degree to which you've acknowledged that. Your privilege. That this yeah. is the identity that you hold, and here's some of the perks that I simply have because of that. That's where that's where I think you can really get into some compassion and mm. empathy and perspective taking and, and really service to mm. more people around you. But I think because of the ways privilege and that language has been used and misused, I'll say. That's where people can kind of get defensive sure, and shut down. Yeah, and it's not a helpful conversation. Um, yeah, so that's why I started with the doctor example because that's, something that's not you take that away, right? There's not very many people that hold that type of privilege, and so, but I think as you get into your own identities, what are the primary identities you hold? Mm -hmm. and how might that prevent you from fully seeing someone's else, else's experience too? That's beautiful, and I think to a beautiful segue into the next question to build on that and go a bit deeper. But how does privilege manifest in society today, and what are some examples of its impacts on individuals, but then communities at large? If we kind of take a step back, sure. Yeah, I think that's great. Well, let's do it. we'll get into it. Let's name the racial <laughs> privilege. Okay, let's, let's do it. We be out here. Okay, racial privilege is a thing. It's a thing that's real because of the history of oppression and marginalization and wrongdoings okay to a lot of <laughs> communities of color whiteness okay not i'm not i'm not mentioning when i use that language it's intentional so i'm not talking mm. about an individual white american i'm saying whiteness yeah as, as that racial construct that holds privilege there are advantages that come with that um that's one identity though mm. okay mm. There are other identities that also hold privilege. If we look, we're going to get into religion a little bit, right? So if you've got the standard religion or kind of most common religion of Christianity in America, that comes with the level of privilege as well. Yeah. The way women have been treated across history in America, being of the male gender comes with that sort of, uh, cisgender comes with that level of privilege as well. So when, here's the thing about it, when you start racking them up, okay, uh, <laughs> like rolling sevens and maybe. <laughs> What's happening? Here's the thing about it: privilege breeds blind spots. So you're not your. It's oversights that you're going to miss someone's very real human experience or pain mm -hmm. because of the privileges you hold. You haven't experienced it, therefore, it simply does not exist. So mm -hmm. the more privileges you have around your identities, the less likely you're going to be to truly see someone else's experience and pain. That's mm. why we talk about privilege. That's why we talk about understanding and being aware of it. Because it's it's the fact that people are hurting. That's the point. Yep. It's yep. not to be more PC, say the right thing. I, I don't care about that. I mean, other people do, but that's not, that's not <laughs> the point. The point to me is that people are hurting. People are right? hurting. And so you have that privilege. Now, here's the part. This is where the intersection, I think, is very critical to consider. I have a friend of mine who also identifies as a Black woman mm. told me one time, she said, you know, I used to think that racial privilege was arguably the highest privilege you could have in the land. Mm -hmm. We talk about it so much. That privilege gives you the most advantage in society. But she said, you know what? After raising a son who lives with disability, different. I'm rethinking, I'm rethinking it. Very and different. The way the disability, people who live with disability are the largest minority group in the world. Mm -hmm. okay? But you see, this is the first time we're really talking about that in this podcast. You see what I mean? There's a lot of ways in which that's labeled invisible. There's a mm. lot of ways in which now here, if we were to go talk about it, Antonio. Right? <laughs> There's a lot of ways in which people of color, people who lack racial privilege, have ability privilege and mm. don't even see it or recognize ways that they might be perpetuating harm to other people, even people in their community because they haven't fully explored what privilege means for yes. them beyond race. Do you think that's something we should be teaching in schools or like what is 
where does the introduction around privilege and identity, where should that introduction happen around privilege and identity and how can that shape or change the way that we think about and see each other and yeah, th the way that we think about and see each other sure. in our day-to-day -day lives. Yeah, that's a great question. So it's funny when I always give talks, that's the two things that I say about what the <laughs> point is, is that people are hurting and children are learning. Those are the yep. two main reasons why this matters. Because you can, you know, psychologists will agree that modeling is a huge way that kids learn. They watch. They watch. Mm -hmm. You don't have to agree to be the model to be the model. OK, so mm. they're watching you, even though you don't even know they're watching what you say and do. They're watching what you don't say mm. and they're watching who you avoid. They're watching they're hearing your language, you know, and the ways that you communicate and those type of labels. So I absolutely think that type of learning happens in childhood. Now, before people at me, OK, well, <laughs> I'm not talking about banning books, putting books, it is not that, okay? What I would assert, okay, is that exposure and contact with real people mm -hmm. in real lives so that people understand the humanity mm -hmm. behind what they're theoretically talking about is powerful, mm -hmm. okay? Very powerful. So for you to say, let's just take the example we were saying with racial privilege. If you have a household in which your children have never actually seen or talked to or communicated with, a Black American, someone of Asian American descent, right, then there's a level of distance there. You're talking about people rather than to them. Mm -hmm. that, that can be inaccurate, okay? You're getting your information from other folks. Having these real exposures and human moments, what you're going to have a harder time doing is stereotyping, yep. generalizing, denying yep. very real human experiences. It won't be as easy for you because you won't have such, or you'll have to come face to face with the fact that you do have bias. Like, right, you just got to own that uh, when, you, when you start thinking that way. I've seen that so personally in the last two years, and I've shared my journey and experience on this show and with many other people, friends, colleagues, but just seeing the transformation with my own family and them understanding their own privileges or coming face to face with that mm -hmm. and identity as well and me claiming my sexuality and mm -hmm. kind of growing up and seeing what the experience was and how they talked about queer people, but mm -hmm. kind of seeing them on the other end now where it's like they've gotten out there in the world or my mom being like, hey, I was at the doctor today and I spoke mm -hmm. to a gay person and that mm -hmm. helped to shift my perspective mm -hmm. or now that I have a younger brother that is mm -hmm. 10 years old and they're like, being queer and these conversations mm -hmm. and having queer parents, it's like their perspectives are really, really shifting. So like mm -hmm, mm -hmm. seeing all of that come full circle has been a little bit wild. But I think as you talk about like where it starts, what I was thinking about was it's not, or building on that, it's not just in the formative years, it's like still looking at this as like a, a lifelong journey or in learning. Yes. Like we yes. can, we're all capable of, of change and shifting our perspectives. Yes. And I think, you know, even with, because I'm aware that there are people who might be hearing that and thinking, oh, so I need to be exposed to different people so I can change my mind, right? Mm -hmm. Or so I can think differently or so I can lose my faith or my convictions or what have you. I really don't think that's it. I think yeah. that instead of that, it's more about understanding and validating someone's reality. Mm -hmm. You know, hard things can be talked about. We just don't have a lot of practice in it. I think that's what starts in childhood is mm -hmm. getting people to kind of enter in and dialogue about certain things in a way that can be difficult and awkward, but is helpful for kids to kind of build their minds around and, and have less anxiety or trepidation or hesitancy around talking about someone's real lived experience or supporting them in a certain way. And what's been your experience or how do you respond to folks that are like, well, you couldn't have experienced that or that can't be true without not physically being in your shoes, like sure. getting people to understand like there are certain things about my lived experience, about who I am that you will just never understand. And what I tell you, you kind of just have to take my word for it. Mm -hmm. um, so I there's two things that come to mind first is just the 
what I think. This is this is Dr. Holman talking, okay? <laughs> and maybe somebody else may feel different. But personally, what I've seen from folks in the pain and the privilege, you know, these type of things that happen when you're talking about identity, one of the biggest aspects of social privilege to me is being able to control the narrative. Mm. You get to say what's true. Mm -hmm. Okay, because your voice is the loudest, it's the most elevated, it is the most believed. Okay, so even when there's a counter narrative, that's what we call it when there's another perspective, it's got to be validated in some way. It's got to be seen as legit, or there has to be enough people to say it. Mm -hmm. You don't even realize that's what's going on in your privilege. So it's not, people don't have malintent necessarily when they're doing that. Mm -hmm. You might, some do, <laughs> you know, I don't know. But, but a lot of folks, they really don't know because that's one of the ripple effects of mm -hmm. is that you get to s compare someone else's reality with your yours, theory, yeah. right? Yeah. Not even to your, your, but just to say, well, I don't think that's true or I've never had that happen to me. So it couldn't have been true. But if we go back to the baby, let's go back to the foundation, that unearned advantage and that we all have and lack privilege. Take mm. it out of one identity and put it in another and see if that happens for you. You know, so if there's an, an identity or an area that you lack social privilege in, what would that be like if somebody told you that? So what would that be like if take it out of anything controversial? Parenthood. If you're a co-parenter, let's say your mother is sitting here talking about, I'm really tired. These kids were really hard for me today. And your spouse came in and was like, they weren't hard for me today. So. I, I don't know. What are you talking about? <laughs> I mean, how you be ready to be contact? Like, are you serious? Or even if it's not hard for you, why can't you just sit here and acknowledge that it's hard for me and it's something that you didn't experience, but how could I support you in that? That's what we're talking about, right? So it's a, it's a reframing and to your point earlier, compassion. Like, can we see beyond what's immediately in front of us and just trying to put ourselves in the shoes of mm -hmm. the experiencer to empathize with them. For sure. So when I, when I give talks around racial advocacy and what that means, part of what I say is a foundation of starting point is to simply believe people when they're talking. Mm. Don't, you don't need to ask for the things that make you feel better. Okay, mm. around their pain or feel like it's legitimate. So believe it's not them, about you, not about you, right? Center mm. them rather than your experience. I think that's the first thing that's helpful. And then also consider, mm. regularly consider that your perspective or your narrative on the world could be inaccurate or incomplete. It just could be because of the things that you've gone through or because of the things you've experienced. Here are my words. I'm not saying that people are the devil incarnate, right? Mm. <laughs> or, or out to get everybody, right? <laughs> because of that, I'm saying that sometimes your experiences are limited and and comfortable. And it's because of the way society shapes. Shaped. You know? um, mm. Beautiful. Thank you for that. And what I would now like to kind of shift to is kind of looking at strategies or ways that we could go about recognizing and addressing privilege, either in personal or professional settings. Mm -hmm. And based on what you've shared, it sounds like it's so easy to miss. And again, we all have blind spots. Mm -hmm. So how do we get more intentional about seeing each other and validating each other's experiences, validating all aspects of identity that make us who we are as mm -hmm. individuals, but also as a collective. Sure. You know, one of the first things that I think about is the compartments that privilege. Mm. So I think another ripple effect of privilege is compartmentalization. You get to talk about the thing when you feel like it, and then mm. you go that compartment and go do something else with it. So you get to sit and go do a webinar on diversity and inclusion and talk about the race thing and then go eat lunch and, <laughs> else, and, right? and so you just kind of put that up in this little box. Um, you put LGBTQIA plushies into a little box and just go ahead and talk about that when it's convenient for you. Mm. Opening those compartments is a great first step. Okay. Mm. How do you open them? Wonderful question. Okay. So what I think you have to learn you you know you, there's a there's a level of how to do that. that's involved in which you have to say let me actually learn about what's gone on mm -hmm. so history storytelling 
me talk to some friends. If you don't have any, you reflect on that first, okay? So, <laughs> you know, talk to people in that community. Watch documentaries, you know, mm-hmm. the podcast, different things where you are hearing the lived experience for other people. And then listen, watch what comes up for you for that. Okay, mm. I don't think you need to censor it or try to be a good person while you're looking at anybody grading you. Okay, allow it. Come up, allow whatever's coming up to come up and process that. If mm. you find yourself feeling defensive, if you find yourself wanting to talk back to them and justify why you're really still a good person, okay, <laughs> you know those have. If you feel overwhelmingly anxious and afraid, right, understand what's going on with you and see where that's coming from. Mm. Right? And see what it is that you tend to do when it comes to confronting your own privilege mm. right? or advocating for someone else, because people can pick up on that right when you're talking to them. It's in, you don't have to say anything. Would, would you say, would you agree? I would 100 percent agree. And I think I've seen instances or the biggest thing that comes to mind is 2020 hits and people like out of the woodworks that are like, I'm not a racist, like want to let you know I'm not a racist. And so. Well, A, that was overwhelming and Mm -hmm. partially uncomfortable for me, but at the same moment, like wanted to lean in. And that was a question for you as well. Like, how do we meet each other in the middle, like working through that awkward uncomfortableness to then get to what we actually want to say and explore with each other that may be tough or maybe, yeah, just icky and uncomfortable to address and specifically things like race or sexual identity. Yeah, I think I too experienced what you're talking about. (laughs) (laughs) So the guilt, the overwhelm, the centering of someone else's experience, which then made me hold two things. I had to hold Mm. my distress plus their distress. Now it's heavier. (laughs) Um, And I don't like that. Now, so that happened when it comes to my identity as a Black woman. Now, here's the thing that I think is very powerful and helps us lean into these types of interactions. We all have and lack privilege. So think Mm. about times when you may have done that to somebody else outside of that identity. I'll give you an example from my own life. That same friend that I mentioned around disability. Mm. Talking to this friend on the phone at one point, and I used a certain phrase that I use when talking about people living with disability. And she had the courage and, and I apl- I appreciate her being like, you know, actually consider using this phrase instead of that other one because it's mm. a little bit older, it implies these things. And what on the outside, what I said was, thank you for telling me, you know, I kind of wanted mm-hmm. to justify why I thought that was the right thing. Internally, I am melting. <laughs> Losing it. <laughs> I said that? I'm a DEI leader. What? I can't be saying the wrong stuff. Okay. She's going to think I'm a terrible friend. I prom- I really didn't mean it. Like I, I really, I care about disability. I promise. Okay. So I'm having <laughs> all of these like emotional reactions. Okay. Ended up hanging up the phone with her and it's still there. Right. Mm-hmm. And so but what I re- this is why I'm saying process was coming up for you and why that is the case. Because what was going on with me as I realized that I said, I'm, it's more about her approval and perception of me than it is about my support of her mm. it's happening. I've lost the plot. I just want her to think I'm a good person. I don't want her to label me badly. It's not necessarily about meeting her support. So what I did was I learned, okay, mm. I, chill, I opened my compartments and mm. I looked up what she was saying and I decided to go ahead and lean into, I'm like, that makes sense. Right. Yeah. Okay. So learn something. Then that day called this friend back a few days later. And I said, hey, I researched what you were talking about. I really appreciate you saying that. I, you know, um, learned from that experience. This friend said, I'm trying not to cry (laughs) because nobody Mm -hmm. ever does that. They either just feel really bad or it's super awkward and they don't know where to go from there. And we never talk about it again. They don't bring it up. So for an opportunity for connection, growth, connection, learning and growth. And growth, all Mm -hmm. human relationships, always are a dance between rupture and repair. Make missteps. You'll make mistakes. If you ever married anyone, <laughs> if you were parented by anyone, okay, you know that people are broken. They're imperfect. They yep. are fallible. Okay. That happens. It's what you do with that. On, mm-hmm. Are you willing to come towards in a way that's humble and open? Mm-hmm. Learn. Okay. Expand outside of your discomfort. 
Okay. Are you willing to hold and process your own emotions around this mm. rather than letting them do it for you? Right. Because what I want to do, God's honest, I wanted to call her back and be like, okay, but for real, are you mad at me? Like, <laughs> right? I, I just wanted some approval. Okay. But I had to hold that. I said, that's mine. That's not hers. Period. Yep. Yep. She was right. Okay. <laughs> it's not like she did anything wrong. So that type of example I share because I think that's how we move the needle when it mm. comes to learning and growth and advocacy. We allow ourselves to be wrong. We allow ourselves to be fallible. And then mm. the rupture the rupture and repair cycle over time. Mm. I see that a lot in my day to day, particularly in conversations with friends mm -hmm. around politics. And it's becoming yeah. more present because we're in an, in an election year. But right. I have seen a lot of friendships kind of, well, publicly on social media like cave and yeah. i try to stay out of the comments but sometimes yeah. i can't help myself but just seeing people cave because it's yeah. like we can't see each other or to even just listen and be like okay don't 100 percent agree with mm -hmm. you but i can hold space for your yeah. truth or hold space for mm -hmm. your understanding of why xyz is what it is mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. absolutely i think now Social media. <laughs> we want to do some advocacy. I don't know. We might even get off the internet, Antonio. This is a dangerous place out there. You know, the, the a dark world. Brings, yes. <laughs> the thing brings this level of confidence because you have the keyboard or the phone. It's yep. not a human body. So people will say things. People are ready and willing to pop uh, off. Yes. <laughs> And, and really what's going on, they they want to read you for filth, right? They want to make sure that you know about your privilege. Yep. And what you've done wrong and oversights. But what did we start this by saying is that we all <laughs> have and lack it, right? Would mm. you want somebody coming at you like that for a privilege that you hold? Mm. Uh, so, yeah, that's why I, th I think empathy, humility, meet people where they at. You don't have to agree with them. Get find some way to be BFF with them. That's not necessary, you know, because, I mean, you might come across folks where you're like, OK, I see what am I as we say. If somebody shows you who they are, believe them. Right. And there are people <laughs> where you're like, we are weak, you know, that. <laughs> and that's cool. But the releasing your control over that you yes. know, and your inability to make them think what you want them to think is not possible. I'll say the other way, the lack of privilege and the instances in which you might experience a level of exclusion or microaggressions, physical harm, you know, mm. those type of ways in which it becomes very clear to you the lack of respect given to your humanity, mm. whatever identity that comes with, right? Or someone's clear feelings of inferiority about you innately mm. just because of something you whole, you know, or something maybe even very naturally or genetically. And so that piece right there can cause significant distress and isolation, withdrawal, a pressure to conform and assimilate. It's stressful. Okay. And so that's why this matters. This because not because people's feelings get a little bit hurt. Because I hear that rhetoric. I hear y'all on the internet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> We're just, oh, people just so sensitive. You can't say anything anymore. While I understand what they're saying, because like we just acknowledge, right? People are ready to come for you on the internet. <laughs> but in real life, okay, <laughs> what's going on is that people have very lived realities of pain and hurt and exclusion and stress. Mm. Okay, around a particular identity. There's language for that. We call it things like race related stress, identity mm. stress, right? Those type of things. Stress is stress is stress. The body don't discriminate, don't care what type of stress it is, gonna send the same hormones for you. Okay. Yes, yeah, so chronic stress erodes the body, right? Mm. So there are impacts that that has on you and your life expectancy. So mm. that's why we want to, to look into this, because when it talks about your mental health, a lot of folks, especially if we're going to use racial privilege, a lot of folks of color have been so used to dealing with that and experiencing that level of chronic stress. They don't even, mm. it, it's not even, it doesn't even register. register. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's actually, that's bad. <laughs> that's not a good thing. That's, that's problematic. Very bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I hear that with my family a lot and I come from a, Jamaican household and they're like, I have a headache, I have pains, it's just gas. And I'm like, no, that mm -hmm. is like stress eating away at your body. Like that mm -hmm. is a real, a real thing. Yes, yes. And I will say one of the things 
when uh, I've done some work around kind of the strengths-based perspective, especially in mm -hmm. the Black community, in the Black diaspora, there's a lot of ways in which this group and a lot of other minoritized groups in America have been incredibly in like awe-inspiring level of resilience mm -hmm. and endurance for a lot of stuff, a lot of trauma, a lot like the fact that we still here, you know, and many <laughs> of us thriving and, and existing, showing up in the space is wonderful, Beautiful. right? Yeah. And okay, I'm gonna say complexity, not but, but and sometimes what can happen in that that race to be resilient and endure and persevere hard things is we don't take time to process what this does to our minds and our bodies, mm -hmm. um, and really it, it, the generational trauma that has gone on. Um, it's very real and very tough. So people will say things like they're commonplace or they always should have been going on that are right, right? Mm -hmm. You know, they're talking about generations of like abandonment or imprisonment or abuse or trauma mm -hmm. or neglect. You know, it is what it is. Or we just been out here surviving. Like, look back up, right? <laughs> That's not okay. You know what I mean? And so we don't even real. realize the very true mental health impact on some of these things or will mm -hmm. Will suffer in silence well and, and not necessarily acknowledge these things that are happening to us and the impact on our mental health because it seems weak you know and kind of silly until it becomes, it becomes an issue yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. manifests as something else yes. sickness yeah all sorts of yeah. sicknesses and life life. yeah so that it starts to be real you know then but i think dialing it all the way back to like hey how are you dealing with day-to-day -day stress Mm -hmm. How are you, this is the way I like to say, metabolizing your stress, mm -hmm. working that out, literally working out, you know, or, or just moving that st those stress hormones along your body so that it doesn't sit there and, and really uh, do that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to pivot and I want to zoom out a little bit more. So we've explored privilege. We've explored identity. We've looked at the intersection of both of those things, mm -hmm. how that affects your mental health. You've touched on resilience quite a bit mm -hmm. as we navigated these. And so as we think about resilience coming up a level higher, like what keeps people moving or driving in the right direction, or even I think about my myself individually, but also my family when we talk about resilience and some of the things that we've been through collectively and the space that religion holds or the mm -hmm. space that spirituality holds in protecting the mind or keeping the mind on track to say, okay, another day, I could do another day, mm -hmm. I could do another day. And that really being a driving force, life force for a lot of people, how does that underlie or intersect or overarch mm -hmm. these three big key areas that mm -hmm. make us who we are and shape shape us as a society and shape us as individuals. Yeah, yeah, it's a powerful question. I, I mean, religion and spirituality is another identity, right? Okay, <laughs> we've, had, we've named some throughout this our time together, but that's another one. Yes, the, it can hold a certain level of advantage. In, in the religion kind of spiritual space, that privilege shows up with uh, freedom most often, you mm -hmm. know, and kind of a disclosure that feels safe. So mm -hmm. you can say those things or do those things in a way in which you feel like you're not going to be literally harmed in some in some area or your holidays are centered, you know, around the calendar. You can wear what you want, use certain songs, phrases, allusions to your God and that be fine. Um, and nobody kind of have it, any repercussions that are very negative for that. So there is privilege in that sense. Now, with that said, outside of all of that, when you're talking about the ways in which people cope with and move forward in some of life's hardest and darkest and most broken moments, the divine has been such a powerful force. Mm -hmm. right? um, so any connections to God, it just in that directly, have been a wonderful coping skill, especially for a lot of Black Americans, right? Mm -hmm. Research some years back said Amer Black Americans are the most churched subgroup in the United States. Okay, so <laughs> I they, believe are, it. they are out <laughs> here, okay? Um, and so you have that piece there. Then you add the religiosity, so the grouping and kind of gathering of folks with mm -hmm. a like-minded spiritual faith 
And that in itself has been another coping school, tool of endurance, community impact. Mm -hmm. there, there's a, we don't even have time to go through all of the <laughs> ways, you know, in which leaders have been brought up, people have been fed. I mean, lives have been saved, you know, be through that, okay? Well, I have a question on that and partially, again, based on my mm -hmm. own lived experience, but is there a difference in the community aspect of like being a part of a church or a group mm -hmm. versus like, I'm an individual pulling tarot cards daily <laughs> like, on my own kind of navigating, yeah, like navigating this thing that is bigger than me and finding inspiration and guidance in that to to live and live a live and meet live and lead a meaningful sure. life like or driven by purpose yes i think that's very true i think that's part of the inherent difference between religion and spirituality as well so that that mm -hmm. distinction there should be theoretically <laughs> this is another concept for another time antonio but both of me <laughs> that people who are religious are also spiritual. Spiritual, yeah. Theoretically. <laughs> right, I ain't talking that today. <laughs> spiritual people are not necessarily religious. Religious okay? people. So yeah. it works one way, not necessarily the other way. And so what you're speaking to is that kind of individual relationship that I think a lot mm. of religious institutions want folks to have, yeah. you know, but they may not feel this desire to be a part of organized religion for many valid reasons that we also <laughs> don't have time to touch on as well. Okay. But because of, I meant, I just mentioned the incredible in life. I am so grateful for the ways in which the organized religion has been a part and supported and endured and mm -hmm. particularly in communities that I'm in, you know, in the black community and, and whatnot. And it's duality. <laughs> <laughs> there are also ways in which harm can be done. Has been, has been done. Has been done. Has been perpetuated. Issues of isms, mm -hmm. racism, mm -hmm. sexism, those types mm -hmm. of things, homophobia, mm -hmm. been perpetuated in these religious institutions, right? And so there are that relationship of religiosity to mental health is a complicated thing. Mm -hmm. okay? It's not one that you can easily say this thing is true. It's not black and white. No, uh, <laughs> but you pun intended. Yeah, that, <laughs> uh, that too, you know, is really not. And so I, I want to just name that as well, that there are people with very complicated relationships with religion and or spirituality. Me being like, well, this is my identity and how mm -hmm. I identify and it's getting to a point where I can see where that person's coming from yeah. and kind of accepting their own lived experience yeah. and understanding of this world and their lives. Yeah, I think you're bringing up something really true. And it's not, that's not out of the realm of possibility, right? I think that's always something to reflect on. But here's the other thing about it. I found when you have safe, trusted relationships that you can talk about hard things within you, you realize they're not necessarily that dissimilar, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think at times what can happen is people will identify on the other side of the spectrum mm -hmm. uh, and out of wounds, you know, but they really start coming to get, you really have honest conversations that are built on empathy. And part of what we do at Lyra Health is when we talk about self-care mm -hmm. and there's all these different ways you care for yourself because there's different aspects of well-being. So you've got your physical, literal body, you know, where you like get your checkups and move your body around, that type of stuff. You got emotional, you got the way you think, your workplace well-being. One mm. of those talk about is spiritual well-being. Now that mm. doesn't necessarily mean that you got to get yourself to the church on Sunday and be, you know, the urge board, whatever that is. <laughs> That's not what that means. But that means that there is a connection to something outside and bigger than yourself. Yeah. That can be very healthy for people psychologically. I feel like we don't talk about that enough. It feels like when I look at the wheel of wellness or what it means mm -hmm. to be a whole holistic human being, mm -hmm. like that's one that's like kind of off to the side. It's like, mm -hmm. we don't talk about it. We don't we bring don't it into the workplace. We, this is like, you keep this to yourself and yeah. this is you on Sunday with whoever you, whoever you do. to practice yes. with. Yeah. hundred <laughs> percent. It's, it's over there with Bruno. We don't talk about it. Okay. Uh, but I think that's what I, that's what I'm saying, you know, to what I was earlier mentioning, it keeps us from having honest and real growing conversations. 
you know, mm-hmm. about who we are and how we show up and how we might want to over time. Mm-hmm. Even like we mentioned with social media, with these type of words, it, it <laughs> limits, right, to dichotomies and limits mm-hmm. us to it's either all or nothing, or you got to be on this team or this team. And I think mm-hmm. human lives are more complex than that. It's, there's a lot more to it. Uh, mm-hmm. Beautiful. Well, I would love to give folks that are listening some key takeaways, tangible things that they can work with from this conversation. I know that these topics are complex. We could talk about each of these for hours, but Dr. Hallman, what advice would you give to people who may be grappling with questions around their identity, privilege, their mental health, or spirituality, religion, religiosity in their own lives? Oh boy, that's an excellent <laughs> podcast. Um, so, you know, first I would say, I think what comes to mind first is the people who have been harmed. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, because you remember I told you the point of all these people are hurting. So, if you've been hurt by people in religious spaces or by your your relationship to God has been manipulated or misused or abused in some way or people with privilege have harmed you in some ways, you know, your worth fully understanding and processing the impact of that on your mind and body and soul. Mm. That's okay. You know, to kind of lean into that, it's okay to even seek professional help about that. You know, that's, that's fine. That's not a weakness. That Mm. is an aspect of your humanity to be Mm. human is to fully process hard things, joyous things, beauty and tragedy all at the same time. Um, So that's what I would say first is it's okay to lean into that. Mm. It doesn't have to overwhelm you. It's not have to be something impossible to process and there's can be healing there. But that first starts with acknowledgement. So I would say that too. And then what I also would want people to reflect on are the ways in which they hold privilege, Mm. armed other people who don't look like them or that look like them. Right. Okay. Because that's the other problem we're talking about enough as well. Harm gets perpetuated in communities, within communities, between people who are supposed to be, this is my brother, this is my, this is who, you know, we both women or what have you. And then you've got harm perpetuated. You've got assault even. I mean, think physical, mm-hmm. not even just psychological harm perpetuated in ways that we don't talk enough about. So I think acknowledging and realizing what are ways that I might be likely to have oversights because of my privilege. How can I create a safer space for people around me? It's a mm. wonderful question to ask. Do you think, or what is your advice for people? And I know some people around me that are like, what I've been through is so dark. It's so heavy. Like the thought of even facing it is like, it. they shut down. Yeah. Where do you start when you're in a place like that, where you feel mm-hmm. like, wow, the weight, it, this is just like too much to even bear or like the thought of even looking at it across the street is mm-hmm. just too much for me. Yeah. And I, I have had moments like that, you know, or even when I don't feel like it's overwhelming, I don't really want to. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> like, mm, that's deep, but I'm just going to go be Not today. Yeah, not today. <laughs> I can't do it. Okay. You be patient with yourself. Okay. Mm. And allow that to be a journey. I would say mm. don't shut the door on potential healing and progress, just leave it unlocked, okay? Mm-hmm. To make a deal with yourself that you'll come back when you're ready, all right? Do do what you can. Mm-hmm. If you don't want to unpack all the stuff with your daddy issues and your religious <laughs> issues and your, you know what I'm saying, all the race-based <laughs> traumatic stress, okay, but just name how you feel. Yep. Do that. Back to it. You know? see, see if there's a connection between how you physically feel and how you emotionally feel. Start there. Okay, mm. this stomach hurt, this stomach ache I keep having, or this headache I keep having, it sure does seem to happen every time I got a big project going, you know, or it sure <laughs> does come up. See if there's patterns mm. there. and just slowly wade into the waters. You don't have to overwhelm yourself by healing or healing perfectly. Sometimes mm. people have a pressure to, like, okay, if realize I gotta this thing, yeah, I got I gotta do it <laughs> perfectly. You chill out, chill out. <laughs> Let it be a journey. Let it be a process for you that you can have mistakes and missteps and fatigue, you know, around. It's okay. I also feel like these are all keys to liberation. So, mm-hmm. in my own experience, like all the hard things that I've come to face and I'm working on facing, it feels like the shedding and everything I face, it's like, 
okay, well, what do I have to lose now? Or relationships will shift and they'll be in a different position or relationships transforming where I'm like, I never thought my mom would be where she is or we're having the conversations that we're having now. And so for people listening, I think it's just knowing that there's so much, there is value and light on the other side of whatever dark or deep thing that you may be in right now that feels like there is no end to it. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a lovely way to say that. I'm I'm thinking about Trisha Hersey's book around rest mm. and the principles that they really outline around rest as resistance and liberation. Mm. And I think that for a lot of communities of color, especially a lot of marginalized communities, the hurt there, the, the rest offers an opportunity, A, to embrace your humanity. So you don't have to keep laboring, you know, mm. for this thing 24 seven, but also starting with rest, but then that rest gives opportunity and space for grief. So really to process what is lost, what has been lost, mm what you would like to be that simply isn't, you know, and it allows you space to process and watch your emotions ebb and flow. You can survive feeling hard things. Mm. But you don't know that until you give yourself evidence. Yeah, actually, yeah. Yes. You got to do it once. You have That's to all it takes it. the first yeah, step. You got to do it. And then, and then lean in. Yeah. So resting on purpose and not as a means to do more in, in the words of Trisha Hershey, I think is, is a wonderful first step too. Mm. Do you have any favorite readings or I know you spoke about your faith with God, spirituality, are there, mm -hmm. is there anything that comes top of mind to you where you're like, you know, this is a really good practice or something mm -hmm. that folks can engage in to help them progress easier or a bit more smooth on their journey to finding themselves? Sure. I mean, the book I just mentioned, Trisha Hersey's book, Rest is Resistance is a wonderful book. It is It'll call you out on your, your, uh, your stuff, the hurriedness, the, that type of thing. I also read a book a while back, Ruth, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, and related to that rest piece and how in America, especially how busy and full we make our lives, mm -hmm. how distracting it is uh, from what's going on with us, you mm -hmm. know, that we tend to be people in this country culturally, you know, who distract, who don't want to go there. You know? <laughs> uh, but I think as the world continues to have flames that burn, <laughs> um, you know, in so many different ways, it, the question people can tend to ask themselves is like, how, what else? You know, like, I don't, <laughs> you know, you're like, you so we are going through it. What else? Yes. What else? <laughs> or, or like, you just end up numb, disengaged, you know, yep. where you're like, sure, sure, that happened. Another crisis. Why not? Yep. Um, and so you kind of detach that survival mode, right? Is what's going on. You, you're, we're experiencing some collective traumas here that is really not mm. supposed to be the case. So, but, but to that end, I think it is helpful to put yourself back in your body. Mm -hmm. You know, because I think that's a way of surviving hard things is that you like, I'm not even going to feel mm -hmm. just, you know, I'm just going to move on. Let it, it's too much. Right. And so mm -hmm. I think allowing yourself that humanness mm -hmm. to truly feel and process what's going on with you is, is truly wonderful. It's very helpful. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And I will also look to add the titles of those books and links mm -hmm. to them in the show notes. Mm -hmm. For everyone listening, this will be kind of the close round out to part one of this discussion. Again, we'll come reconvene to dive a little bit deeper into the current state of mental health and well-being in Black America. But a nice topic, huh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, next, yeah, that's a whole other topic. But before we go, Dr. Holman, some rapid fire questions in hopes oh. that we all get to know you a little bit better. Okay. I will go ahead and kick this off. So if you could have dinner with any historical figure, who would it be and why? Oh, man. Any historical figure? Like just a human person? I was going <laughs> to say Jesus, but <laughs> uh, a person. Oh, that would be, that would be. Yeah. That would be like, yeah, <laughs> you said, I would say, I would love to have dinner with Toni Morrison. Nice. That'd be pretty awesome. <laughs> awesome. What's your favorite hobby or pastime outside of work and aside from college football? <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, okay. Um, do you know what it is? Don't judge me. It's, it jigsaw puzzles. Okay. The jigsaw puzzles. I love that. I love it. 
Yeah. I love that. What is the best piece of advice you've ever received? Wow. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you this, this one. It's not, it's not as rapid fire as you'd like, but I used to tell this to a lot of my students when I was teaching a lot. This comes from Dawson's Creek. Okay, so this is where the, one of the best pieces of advice. Um, they were talking about someone going to college and mm -hmm. they said, you know, when someone first goes to college, they often feel really insecure. So they race to try to catch up mm -hmm. instead of pretending to, uh, slowing down to actually know things. They pretend to know them. And they said they forget or they don't know that the discomfort of uncertainty is the sweetest part of the experience. Mm -hmm. so that you can feel comfortable not knowing you can learn anything. And if not, you stopped before you've begun. And I mm. love that. It, it kind of changed my life as it works. I was very young when I heard it. And I had that feeling, you know, in high school, early college, you're like, oh, everybody knows this but me. Yeah. You know, you got a free, you have that paralyzing moment where you're like, oh, so let's get back that drill. But actually leaning into the discomfort that comes with learning is something I've taken with me for years after I heard it. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to write that down. Do you have a favorite quote or mantra that you live by, aside from the one that you just shared? Yeah, um, <laughs> that you were made on purpose and with purpose. Beautiful. And where can people find you to learn more? And don't find me. I'm entirely too introverted. <laughs> don't find me. I don't talk to strangers unless I'm doing uh, No, you can find me on LinkedIn. I'm on the Instagram at times when social media is not giving me ulcers. So, uh, I'm under Dr. Holman, so I am there. Beautiful. Dr. Holman, thank you so much. Thank you to everyone that stuck around to get to this point in the conversation. We really appreciate you. Join us again next month for the continuation of this discussion where we will dive into the current state of mental health and well-being in the Black community. Thank you all so much for your continued support, for tuning in, for all the shout outs. I really, really, really appreciate it. Much love to you all. Take good care of yourselves and we will see you very, very soon.